Uh, thank you, uh, Ilya and Andreas and everyone at MSA and RIMG for organizing the session. This has been really fun and interesting and, and stimulating. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Naomi Levin and the rest of our research group here, who, whom you can see, um, and uh, without whose hard work and dedication, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about uh, would, would not have been possible. Um, so keep it pretty straightforward, um, and I'm not going to really follow the outline of our chapter. A lot of it was on hydrology, which um, Jakob Surma has already covered. So I just want to, you know, discuss applications to continental paleoclimate um, and specifically looking at lakes uh, and then some new data uh, from our lab for soil carbonates and speleothems and then uh, also animals, uh, which Andreas talked a little bit about. Not going to get much into the methodology. Um, I think uh, assume that what Zach covered and uh, presumably what uh, Jordan Wasbrock is going to cover will, will, will be good there. Okay, so this is actually a slide from my 2008 job talk at Johns Hopkins University, and it's sort of a, an inorganic isotope geochemist's view of continental environments and ecology and paleoclimate. And so, of course, plants figure in prominently as the, the primary producers, animals that are eating those plants, bones and teeth and soil carbonates, which are the dur durable geological archives of these environments. Um, aqueous systems, uh, shells, this kind of thing. Um, and a number of isotope systems, you know, by 2008 were very well understood, delta 13C, 15N, delta B, delta 18, meteoric hydrological cycle, this kind of thing. What was exciting at that time was clumped isotopes, delta 47, so we could finally um, get the real temperature of formation of some of these minerals and um, also be able to back calculate the delta 18 of the parent water. And then what was brand new on the horizon at that time was uh, Delta 17O, and um, only three years earlier had Barkin and Luz come up with the high precision uh, isotope analysis for waters. And so the real hope was that we'd be able to extend and develop analytical methods for things like carbonates and appetites. So fast forwarding 12 years, um, uh, all of us collectively, um, uh, the community has really made a lot of progress in this respect. Um, okay, so if you're reconstructing continental paleoclimate, you know, you really want to make use of this big delta 18 climate signal, Donsgaard equation type thing, Rayleigh distillation. Um, and of course, the problem is evaporation. So this is a nice compilation of waters by Horton et al. Um, and up in panel A, you see uh, what's falling out of the sky, precipitation, and then I've superimposed a, a kind of uh, evaporation trajectory um, in delta D versus delta 18 space. And so going over to rivers, you can see that we're getting a little more effects of evaporation and lakes, quite a lot of evaporation. Um, and if you look at panel D, which is just the deviation from the meteoric water line, the positive shift owing to evaporation, then, you know, in lakes, you can easily get 10 per mil or more of evaporative modification. So the dilemma uh, going back to the continental paleoclimate is, you know, if I pick up a 50 million year old mollusk shell, measure the delta 018, uh, maybe measure clumped isotopes so I know the formation temperature so I can back calculate the parent water composition. Well then, you know, is that parent water reflective of what fell out of the sky, pristine precipitation, or was it um, evaporatively modified? And so of course, this is where triple oxygen isotopes is coming in so handy. Um, so in panel B, you know, analogous to the meteoric water line, we can have a triple oxygen isotope uh, water line. And uh, because uh, the evaporation involves the diff molecular diffusion of water vapor through air, this has a very uh, different uh, triple isotope exponent, uh, about 0.5185 very different from the equilibrium fractionation between liquid and vapor of 0.529, um, and also very different from our chosen 0.528 uh, slope. So, uh, so evaporation really stands out in triple oxygen isotope space. Okay, so, so lakes. Um, so yeah, you can take a Craig Gordon uh, type equation here that's giving us the isotopic composition of the evaporative flux from the lake. 
combine it with a isotopic and mass balance steady state model for lakes that features inflow outflow evaporation do a lot of mind boggling algebra well at least for me um, and get a messy equation like the one in the center um, and we've seen that Surma et al and Gazquez have, have presented equations like this and and evaluated them so this is a nice flexible equation for looking at lakes and in particular this xe parameter is the fraction of water leaving the lake system by evaporation. So for example, a closed basin lake where all of the water is leaving by evaporation, this, this Xe value is one. However, this, this equation has a lot of parameters and so, um, and more parameters than we can measure isotopic compositions for. And so it's always gonna be underdetermined. So, you know, how would you back out relative humidity or fraction evaporation, uh, that, that can be challenging. Uh, nevertheless, um, my student, Hao Yuan Ji, and I several years back wanted to, to kind of evaluate this equation. And in the Western US, there's a lot of really nice, simple closed basin lakes. So Pyramid Lake here is one example where you've got one or maybe two or three mountain streams going into the lake, no outlets, so the only evaporative loss. So, so pretty simple closed basin systems to study. Okay, so the, the, this, this figure on the left is just the model predictions of if you had initial waters, i.e. the rivers flowing into these lakes, uh, then the steady state closed basin lakes would look like these gray circles for different relative humidities. And this is modeled using this, um, Kind of canonical alpha diff. This is the oxygen 18 alpha diff of uh, 1.014, so 14 per mil. So that, that is to say that during the transport of water vapor away from the boundary layer, it's got about 50% diffusive character. So if it was pure diffusion, it would be a, about a 28 per mil fractionation. And then 50% turbulent character, which is non fractionating. Okay, and so in these figures, um, these are the results from a number of these lakes. So the open triangles are the rivers flowing into the lakes. The gray circles are the lakes themselves. The, the, the data in A, B, and C are all the same. What differs are the models. So, you know, it's turning the knobs on some of these different parameters. So, you know, using this canonical uh, 14 per mil alpha diff, um, it actually doesn't quite jive with the data for these lakes because we know that the relative humidity, if you weight it towards the times of evaporation, is about 40 to 50, 40 to 45 percent. Um, and so if you go to panel B, if we make alpha diff smaller, so that would be to say it's windier, more turbulent, um, then we can get a pretty good match. Um, the paper by Surma et al. in this RIMG volume is uh, had some really interesting data that, that Jakob talked about, uh, water vapor over the Alps, a very high CAP 17O. And so in panel C, we just plug in a, a high value that's um, inspired by their data and you, you can get a, a, a closer fit. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of parameters, but, you know, if we step back a little bit, there's a clear signature of evaporation in these waters. Um, and so that's geologically useful at face value that yes, these are evaporated, you have to, take that reconstructed delta 018 with a bit of a grain of salt that that's been evaporatively modified compared to what fell out of the sky. Well, can we do more with this though? And the answer is yes, if you if you get clever. And so I like this paper by Gaz Kez et al. They were actually looking at gypsum hydration waters um, and uh, resolved. So we've got a few different time periods in the graph on the, the left and clear, very pronounced evaporative um, modification. And so the question is, you know, can can they resolve any relative humidity difference between the, the younger Dryas and the late Holocene? And, you know, and on the left panel, there's this little ellipse that shows all these different factors that the wind is that basically that alpha diff factor E over I is the X E in our uh, in that equation. And, you know, it's under constraint, but but their approach is to Take, take that equation and do a Monte Carlo parameter variation. And then for each set of parameters, you ask whether or not the predicted isotopic composition uh, matches what you actually observed. And if it doesn't match, you throw it out. If it matches, you keep it. And so those 
blue and red fields are the matching parameters. And so while there would be some uncertainty in the absolute relative humidity, you can say very confidently that there was a shift in relative humidity between those two time periods. Um, another thing, uh, so Howie Wan and I pivoted a little from this question and said, well, okay, let's not try to reconstruct any one of those, those parameters, but what else, what else can we do? And so um, this is another Monte Carlo variation of, uh, of a bunch of these parameters within a fairly wide uh, parameter space. And what we found, which is a little surprising, was that the evaporation trajectory and slope was fairly conservative. You know, there's some variation in there, but it's not all over the map. And so if you know that slope upon which things evaporate, then you can actually take measured composition of carbonate and reconstruct the parent water. So that's these blue um, pluses here. And this is a Monte Carlo error propagation kind of thing. And then you can back project along that evaporation slope to the intersect with the meteoric water line. And so the goal here is to reconstruct the delta O18 of the precipitation before it was evaporatively modified. And so now triple oxygen isotopes has really given us two things. One is this face value, is it evaporated, how evaporated um, kind of signal. And then furthermore, we can back project and, and get, you know, there's quite a bit of error here, but it's um, a useful estimate of the unevaporated um, precipitation in the basin. Um, so just by way of example, um, Eocene Green River Basin. So this is uh, a bunch of lacustrine sediments that were surrounded by the early Laramide uplifts um, in southwest uh, Wyoming, northeast Utah. Um, at the height of the, the you know, basically early Eocene climatic optimum. So this is hot house climate. Um, and so this paper way back in 1996 with this provocative title, Skiing in the Eocene Uinta Mountains, you know, so they were looking at delta O18 variation in this drill core of lacustrine sediments. So you see in this black filled in kind of pattern. Most of the values, this is PDB of the carbonate are about minus four per mil. So if you reconstruct water uh, with some assumptions, then that's like minus five-ish per mil water, which is like a nice Eocene hothouse kind of composition. Um, but there are these pulses of very low delta O18 carbonate, which they interpreted as representing low delta O18 uh, water of like minus 15 per mil or maybe a little lower. Um, which, you know, it was kind of an arm wavy interpretation, but, you know, those are pretty low values. That's kind of the composition that we see today in Uinta snowfall. Um, and so maybe that means that, that these Laramide mountains were pretty high back then. And maybe there was, they were even these nice white snow capped peaks, which would be unusual also given that in the basin there are crocodilian fossils, um, palm fossils. So it'd be quite an exotic scene. Well, um, so Natalie Packard, who's a grad student in our group, did a lot of work in, in collaboration with Nathan Sheldon and um, Rebecca Rhodes at Ethan Highland at uh, North Carolina State University, and sampling some different carbonates from, from the basin. And so the, the figure on the left is just, um, if you take the average value of the stromatolite sample, and then do some Monte Carlo um, back calculation of the parent water. Um, we have clumped isotope temperatures on these. Then that's the sort of probability distribution of the parent waters. And then do this back projection uh, to the black asterisk. Asterisk, sorry, my MATLAB graphing skills are not very sophisticated, but hopefully you get the picture. Um, anyway, so we're, we're also reconstructing low uh, delta 18 waters going into these Eocene basins. So, you know, taking this and then going to snowfall or elevation is, is obviously a little bit more challenging. So I'll just leave it there that uh, quite remarkable that um, modern, similar to modern um, Delta 18 values um, in this early Eocene hothouse climate. Okay, shifting gears to soils. So this is uh, brand new stuff. We didn't, didn't even have enough data to really talk about it in the RIM-G volume uh, back in May when that was written. Um, uh, but okay, so what we're talking about is carbonates that form in soils. Um, typically you have a zone of leaching and calcium transport uh, near the surface. Um, 
carbon is primarily coming from soil respiration, soil CO2, also atmospheric CO2 diffuses into there. And as the equation shows, if you remove CO2 and water, then you promote calcium carbonate precipitation. Um, and so if, if that removal of water features um, evaporation, yeah, of course, the other way to do it is dewatering of the soil by plant roots, which is not fractionating. Um, anyway, so, you know, is there a 17 signal in soil carbonates that'll be useful? So Emily Beverly, who was an NSF postdoc with us, she's now at University of Houston, put together this amazing transect in East Africa of modern soils um, across this aridity gradient from the humid kind of shores of Lake Victoria um, all the way southeast to the, the um, eastern arm of the rift where it's pretty arid digging uh, deep pits in the soils, finding, collecting soil carbonates. Um, so she did a real bang up job. And th this is actually on the ESOR archive. It was just posted a couple of days ago. So you can check that out. Um, and so just cutting to the results. Um, so in this figure on the right, we've got CAP 17 and this is the reconstructed soil water um, from, so Emily measured the carbonates and then we used um, fractionation factors and temperatures of formation from clumped isotopes to back calculate the, the parent soil waters. And then the x-axis is a, a metric of aridity. It's water deficit, which is potential evapotranspiration minus mean annual precipitation. But what you can see is there's a, a big 17 signal with the arid sites looking evaporated and the less arid sites looking not too evaporated. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit, uh, Julia Kelson, who's another NSF postdoc fellow working with us, um, as, as well as with Sierra Peterson, um, took a different approach and, and Julia's approach was just getting all of the, the good modern soil carbonate she should, could get her hands on, emailing people, um, doing a little bit of opportunist, opportunistic field work here and there. Anyway, and she's getting a very similar um, pattern. This is a slightly different aridity index, but she's getting this sort of evaporated look for the really arid environments and the, the step-like shift. And so the sort of hypothesis that we're running with here is that, that it is showing this difference between soils that are primarily dewatered by abiotic, you know, by evaporation. So in the arid environments to where it gets humid enough that you have plants that can effectively dewater the soils with their roots, which again is non-fractionating. Um, so we're still sort of sorting out the details of that and trying to get some funding to do uh, a little bit more of that work and shore this up, but it's looking very promising. Okay, so shifting gears to speleothems. Um, so this is spearheaded by Ty Huth, who is another postdoc in our lab. Ty's working with Julia Cole and Matt Lackney, uh, Larry Edwards, and trying to see what 17.0 can tell us about um, speleothems. Now, of course, the analysis is very difficult, time consuming, it takes a lot of sample. Uh, so we're not gonna you know, zip this thing up in high resolution the way you can with Delta 018. But rather, the question is, you know, can we can we sample, take representative samples, the highs and the lows and the in-betweens in terms of delta O18, and use 17O to tell us about the mechanisms of delta O18 variation? So are we looking at kinetic fractionation? Are we looking at uh, real changes in, in the delta O18 of meteoric waters through time? Um, can 17O tell us a little more? So Ty's approach is to, to come up with um, sort of an interpretive framework, um, and it has to do with the slopes that you would get in CAP 17O versus Delta O18 space for different processes. Okay, so on the left, if it's Rayleigh distillation, we expect an array of data to plot in a horizontal line. Okay, if it's an evaporation, then we expect a negative slope. It's cave kinetics, so Weifu Go and Chen Zhou, um, one of their, of several of their very impressive papers in the last couple of years, uh, address speleothems and predict a positive slope for, uh, th this would be the um, kinetic effects related to CO2 degassing from the film of water um, as the speleothem is forming. 
Um, and then there could even be remote effects, the, the, the conditions in the source region over the oceans of, of atmospheric water vapor. Um, Shah et al. came out with a paper this year on CAP72 in spelate dumps and drip waters from Asia and explored a little bit the, the, the effect of temperature, cave temperature change. And, and that's in there as well. It's probably a smaller effect you know, on the order of 10, 15 per meg, maybe for five to 15 degree changes in temperature. So it's in there, but we think some of these other effects might be larger. So this would be Ty's uh, interpretive framework, again, slope based. And so we'll go to the data and this is a little busy, but so we've got four panels here, um, A, B, C, D, each one is a different cave system um, or combination of caves and uh, in panel A, for, for example, in the left is just the schematic and outlined in red is the sort of expectation based on previous interpretations. So for Cave of the Bells, Julia Cole and colleagues interpret this as, as a Rayleigh distillation, kind of a real climate thing, maybe with a little bit of seasonal difference, um, you know, more summer rainfall or less during different time periods. Anyway, uh, so Ty's data are the X's, which are mean values of samples, and the small diamonds, which are replicates. So Ty's worked incredibly hard to beat down the uncertainty so that we can even make significant um, estimates of these slopes. But what you can see is that we're looking at pretty flat lines, maybe in general with a little bit of a negative slope. Another thing Ty has done is, is look at modern rainfall, and if you plot the seasonal distribution, you get a slight negative slope. So the summer rainfall seems to be a little bit heavier than the winter rainfall. And so uh, to first order, this CAP safety is telling us that the this sort of climate Rayleigh distillation and maybe a little bit of seasonality interpretation of these important um, archives of climate over the past several tens of thousands of years, that, that that's basically the correct interpretation. Certainly there's no indication of, of kinetic effects with this positive slope. Um, of course, that, that is yet to be experimentally verified and we're, we are working on that. That got slowed down a little bit by the, the COVID thing. Okay. Anyway, and then finally, um, animals. Okay. Um, and folks have been looking at delta O18 and bone phosphates and teeth for a long time. And, and uh, Boaz Luz, of course, as you might not be surprised, was in on that early on as well. So we, we owe a lot to him in triple oxygen isotopes and, uh, and Eugenie Barkin. Uh, but okay, so here's a graph from 1990, uh, Linda Aliff and Alan Shivas, and they're looking at modern macropods, so kangaroos from Australia. And so you see a huge effect in delta O18 that correlates with relative humidity. And what this is, is, is evaporation. And it's both, you know, these are selective browsing animals. So it's evaporation as, as um, originating in leaf waters that the animals are eating. They're probably drinking evaporated pools of water. Um, and so of course, when we say evaporation, our eyes light up in terms of CAP 17 that we're gonna have a big signal here. Okay, so Huan Ting Chu and I uh, developed a, a adaptation of Cone's 1996 uh, body water model that uh, features a number of inputs and outputs of water, steady state mass balance model, and I've highlighted in red, just red arrows, some of the, the things where we think these are going to be big CAP 17 levers. And of course, as Andreas discussed, um, when we breathe in, we breathe in atmospheric O2, we use it to metabolize food and so that signature ends up in our bodies and that's this very anomalous minus uh, 432 per meg signal. Okay, um, so this body water model, you know, there are lots and lots of knobs to turn and so how do you sort of cut through the, the kind of confusion and come up with something tractable and our, our approach is to have these end member physiologies. Okay, and so one end member would be this max water, or we could call it the hippo model, and that's shown in the open circles. So this is an animal physiology where they're not very good at conserving water, so they have to have access to drinking water all the time. So humans are like that. We go through tons and tons of water. Uh, so if you're drinking a lot of water, you're going to look like meteoric waters. Okay, we've got this max evap model. Um, 
So a giraffe or oryx or um, deer even would be uh, in this category. So these are animals that if they have green leafy vegetation, then they really don't need to drink much water. So they're gonna look evaporated like the leaves, the leaves that they're eating. Um, and remember that, that leaves are, fresh leaves are 60, 70, 80 weight percent water. So there, there's a lot of water in there. Um, and then this third kind of end member is this max oxygen model. Uh, the kangaroo rat here is um, a good example. And um, I was Googling kangaroo rats, and this is not for the faint of heart, but there are some amazing videos of kangaroo rats facing off with sidewinder rattlesnakes. So check that out. Um, you know, well, be careful, uh, but they're very exciting. Okay, anyway, the kangaroo rat, um, is something that it's not eating a lot of green leafy vegetation, eating a lot of seeds, and it's something that's gonna maximize this atmospheric O2 signal, um, and that, that anomalous signal. Okay, so just looking at um, a bunch of data sets in the context of our model. So the model predictions are sort of grayed out in the back. Um, so Pack et al. beat everyone to the chase in 2013. Um, and so you've got pigs, African elephants, porpoise, so a marine mammal, humans. So they're all looking very watery. So that, that seems to make sense. We're happy with that. Kangaroo rats, wood mouse, they're, they're plotting closer to this um, max ox model. So that the patterning makes sense. Um, we see similar sort of patterning in, in uh, our data set from 2014. So a bunch of domestic birds, so just getting eggshell samples. Um, they're looking very watery. That makes sense because uh, they usually have a dry food diet um, on farms, so they have to drink a lot of water. Uh, but then we have wild ostrich down lower in the gray circles and giraffe, and so they're looking evaporated. So that makes sense. Um, and then Whiteman et al., this is uh, Zach Sharp's group. Um, and as we saw earlier, they have some of these phenomenally low CAP 17 0 um, desert rodents. Uh, so these are wild rodents from New Mexico and Arizona, I believe they're actually lower than our model predicts. And so, you know, there, there's some work to do, some things to figure out, but in general, you know, the, the point here is that there is a huge amount of variation in CAP 17 0 and it generally makes sense. Um, and so it's, it's a useful ecological signal for sure. Um, so just one final data set. So Sophie Lehman, who is a former student of Naomi's, um, working in collaboration with Turi Serling and a number of other people, this is another East Africa special, so aridity gradient from the forest, Turi Forest, to the, the desert, Turkana. Um, so we've got mean annual precipitation versus CAP 17. And this is of the carbonate component of the bioappetite. So this has not been converted into the equivalent body water. Um, but looking at hippos, which don't seem to respond to mean annual precipitation or aridity. So they're just in the meteoric waters, recording meteoric waters. We've got elephants, and maybe they're a little more sensitive. Um, definitely um, a little, you know, obviously they don't have to live in the water like hippos do. Uh, but then giraffe really accentuates this aridity signal. Okay, and so what we're seeing is abidairs, you know, the giraffes look like elephants because it's humid. And if you look at leaf water models, then you don't get as much evaporative enrichment um, when it's humid. Um, and so, so we've got a big ecological signal. We've got a climate signal here to work with. What I don't have time to talk about, uh, what which Andreas was talking about, is that you know we've got the CAP 17 of atmospheric O2 in here, which relates to PCO2 and GPP. And so this sets up a, a deep time kind of PCO2 GPP proxy. But of course, it's going to be have to have to be interpreted through the sort of filter and dealing with this ecological variation. Um, and our, our RIMG chapter describes a method where you could, could kind of mitigate that um, variation and, and actually embrace it to get um, better estimates of um, the CAP 7 Joe of ancient atmospheric O2, and then from that get PCO2 or GPP. Okay, so I'll wrap it up and just simply say that, you know, I hope you're convinced that there's a lot of great stuff to work on with 17.0 in continental environments, that there's a lot of potential to, to really uh, increase our ability to reconstruct these environments and paleoecology. Then of course, the, the, the big problem here is, you know, these analyses are just so damn difficult, you know, so 
doesn't matter if you're doing direct fluorination or you're doing the reduction fluorination like we're doing at Michigan or if you're doing platinum catalyzed CO2 O2 exchange. Uh, time consuming, you know, and so this is going to limit um, the wider application. So, so maybe laser spectroscopy will rescue us. Certainly, I, I fully endorse Zach's um, suggestion that we use those values that uh, Jordan determined um, and just take those for NBS 1918 and IAEA, IAEA 603. We'll just adopt those and that, that will streamline things quite a bit if we can re rely on those. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do we have uh, written questions, Han? No, we don't have anything in the chat. So I'd like to maybe ask a question. Uh, if you consider like a time integrated history, I mean, you will consider obviously some um, uh, episodes of crystallization or uh, organismal growth. Uh, like if you consider uh, when organism develops and um, moves from environment to environment, can you record changes uh it's uh, re refers to organisms maybe teeth and second maybe um, if you consider clays forming in various environments do you expect um, processes um, uh, like uh, integrated over hundreds of years thousands of years What's yeah, it dep yeah it depends on the archive so the soil carbonates for example um probably form over hundreds to thousands of years so that's going to be integrating a lot of time a tooth or a shell you know like people have looked at hypsodon high crown teeth and you can actually get like year long resolved records. And of course shells, you can get the seasonality. And I guess you'd know more than me about clays, but I'm assuming that would integrate quite a lot of time. Um, and, but potentially um, if you had clays that are representing, you know, pure continental environments, then you should, should get some big signals related to evaporation there. And I have a question. It's Zach Sharp here. Uh, you have minus 150, I think, kind of as your ox model. And given that arrow two is way down at minus 440 or so, can you explain why that is? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd have to look at the details. But um, so one thing is that if you look at the effluxes, then CO2 is actually working against this sort of uh, change. So the more oxygen you lose as CO2, the more that makes the CAP 17 higher and the delta O18 lower. And so that's the flip side of these kangaroo rat type things is that um, a lot of their oxygen efflux of CO2. So that's going to be buffering the, the signal. I'd have to look and see what the percent atmospheric O2 is um, for that mock max ox model relative to what you guys have in the, the Whiteman et al. paper for some of these critters. Um, any more questions for Ben? Well, thank you. So we will move on. Thank you.